Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Listen again for the word of God. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you might expect, I have a lot of pastor friends on Facebook. And sometimes I'll admit there's an awful lot of posting and geeking out about all things liturgical and theological. Recently, my friend Luke, a pastor in Minnesota, was reflecting on his grief five years after his mother's death. And he concluded his post with a gem of a summary of Advent as the yearly reminder that the deepest dark is not where the light goes to die, but rather it is in the deepest dark that the light is reborn. The deepest dark is not where the light goes to die, but rather it is in the deepest dark that the light is reborn. We all know a lot about the dark. This time of year, we spend more time in the physical dark, with the sun draining away well before most of us finish work for the day. For some, the physical dark also triggers the inner darkness of depression and anxiety, with their weight like a lead blanket. As we move through the holiday season, grief looms large for so many as they're faced with empty chairs at the table or are forced to leave behind much long-cherished traditions because a key person is no longer here to make them happen. For others, the holidays mean the anxiety and pain of family strife, either on full screaming display at the dinner table or present as that silent, lurking elephant in the room when certain family members just don't show up. We turn on the news and hear about mass shootings, young lives shattered by opioids, impeachment and government corruption, systematic human rights abuses in China and so many other places around the globe, natural disasters, thousands of children still locked away from their parents at our borders, And of course, the list just goes on and on. We dwell in deep darkness on a daily basis. Advent, though, promises us that the light of the world comes to meet us in the dark. Whispers of that hope of rebirth. Advent teaches us how to wait and to watch for Jesus Christ coming to us again. Not just in that final triumph of the great second coming, but in all of the small, significant ways Jesus enters and re-enters our lives each and every day. And as we grope and stumble through the world's darkness, Advent gives us a vision to find our way into God's kingdom among us. The prophet Isaiah encourages us to lift our eyes from the mess of present reality 
and to fix our gaze instead on God's promises. In days to come, Isaiah writes, the Lord's house will be lifted up higher than everything else. It will be a holy focal point for all the land. No more will we lift our eyes to our own creations, skyscrapers of excess consumerism and greed, but rather we will look to the Lord together. The Lord's house will be a place of diversity. People of every nation will go there to learn, and in God's instruction we will find common ground. Our invented barriers and divisions will crumble away, and we will no longer suffer beneath the persecution of our own prejudices. God's justice will prevail and peace will flourish. As a result of God's arbitration, both the instruments and practice of war will become irrelevant and obsolete. God does not need to resort to or encourage violence in order to resolve problems. And our hearts will be so completely transformed that we won't cling to our weapons of destruction, our swords and spears, our guns and bombs, because it's our right to bear them. But instead, we will gladly turn them into instruments that sustain life. Plowshares and pruning hooks, tractors and seed spreaders. Isaiah casts us an Advent vision of God's kingdom that truly captures the imagination. He gives us words of hope to refill us when we're empty and to renew our energy for the calling that is ours. It's a common axiom that whatever gets the majority of our focus will flourish. Advent gives us the opportunity to reset our sight and to refocus our hearts on light, hope, and peace so that they may flourish. Isaiah doesn't give us a clear-cut five-step plan for living into God's peace-filled kingdom and making it a reality. Instead, the prophet simply invites us to walk in the light of this vision and to let it illumine our paths. Then we can make our choices personal, relational, political, and communal, in its light. This is long-term work, and oftentimes hard to sustain amidst the swirl of the world's chaos. To keep ourselves from giving up in despair and believing that this is just all pie-in-the-sky optimism, it's vital that we stay grounded in God, that we remind ourselves of our vision over and over and over again, and that we sing out the stories of success when we find them that show progress is possible. So I want to share with you this morning three stories of people who are steadily working hand in hand with God to make Isaiah's prophecy of God's peace-filled kingdom a bit more of a reality. Healing Hearts is a ministry of the Women's Department of the Church of Christ in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Christy Boyd, a Presbyterian mission co-worker, supports this ministry. It helps children and teens in Congo recover from the trauma inflicted through proxy wars and internal conflicts. Children like Gaylord age 10, who witnessed his home burn at the hands of militiamen and who continues to suffer flashbacks. Her children like Dorica, age 15, and Kanyere, age 16, who both became pregnant through sexual assault. Using stories, crafts, games, and Bible lessons, Healing Hearts strives to help these children understand their grief, gain self-worth, let go of revenge, and ultimately forgive those who wounded them. 
unhealed childhood trauma greatly increases the risk of developing personal problems and a tendency toward violent behavior in later life. By helping these young people deal with their pain now, healing hearts helps the peaceable kingdom of God to flourish and grow among them. When the congregation of First Presbyterian Church in Arlington, Virginia, learned that one of their neighbors was facing deportation, they found an opportunity to work for justice and peace just outside their church doors. Knowing the very complex array of issues that can make achieving justice in such a case difficult, First Presbyterian looked to Congregation Action Network for help. This network of faith communities seeks to show love, compassion, and hospitality in the face of hate and discrimination. They focus on deportation defense to keep immigrants in their communities from being sent out of the country. And they use all available legal options to help those immigrants achieve permanent residency. The Congregation Action Network holds Defend Your Rights training, accompanies immigrants to check-ins with immigration officials, provides hospitality and shelter to those at risk of deportation, and advises congregations who wish to step out in support of immigrants and to advocate for immigrant rights in their own communities. Through their social and legal advocacy, community organizing, fundraising, and family support, network congregations like First Presbyterian bear peace to the marginalized people coming to this country to find a new home. They sow a few more seeds of God's kingdom in the world. And right here in Morristown, Wind of the Spirit runs a program called Youth Led, a leadership development program based off of the Quaker-founded Alternatives to Violence Project, or AVP. AVP maintains that conflict is a part of life, but violence doesn't have to be. The program empowers people to lead nonviolent lives, first by having them examine the ways injustice, prejudice, frustration, and anger may lead to aggressive behavior and violence, and then by training them in creative conflict management based on affirmation, respect, community building, cooperation, and trust. For the past five years, Youth-Led has offered these trainings to youth right here in our area, with a particular focus within our communities of color. Over 25 youth attend their two-week summer camp each year, and a de delegation of these youth-led leaders have participated in national AVP gatherings. Some of these young leaders have then gone on to share their skills by co-facilitating AVP workshops at the Edna Mahan Correctional Facility for Women in Clinton, or by participating in Wind of the Spirit campaigns and solidarity actions. By learning and practicing nonviolence, these youth bring God's peaceable kingdom to Morristown. So as we move into Advent, Isaiah's vision remains there, sparkling before us to help us find our way. And if we take the time to look past the ever-present darkness, we can find seeds of that vision are indeed springing up all around us. God's kingdom of peace is among us. The light is here and present even now. And so our invitation is to continue the journey toward that promised world we long to see. Let us continue to sing forth the vision of hope and to add our own stories of success. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen.